In chapters 12 and 13, we will study game theory. In chapter 12, we will study the single period or static game. Basically, the game only take at one shot and the players only have one chance to play their strategy. In chapter 13, we will study the sequential game or say the dynamic game where players play their strategies in turns and they have several periods to interact with each other. To represent a game, we have this payoff matrix. Because we are talking about firms, so the payoffs are profit. Then at some places, we also call this matrix the profit matrix. This kind of table, or say the payoff matrix, is so-called normal form representation of a game. It's most frequently used for static game. Actually, for sequential games, we can also convert a form, so-called extensive form of representation into the normal form. But that's a much more complicated process. For our purpose of study a single period game, the normal form, this payoff matrix, is quite enough. First, we look at for this matrix, there are columns and rows. And we put American Airlines onto the columns. So these two different columns, the lower quantity 48 and the higher quantity 64, are the two different strategies for American Airlines to play. Because American Airlines, this player is playing the strategies according to different columns. This player on top also called the column player. And then obviously the two different quantities is the two different strategies that the column player can play. Following the same terminology, United Airlines here, another player in the game will be called the role player because its strategies are listed on the rows of this payoff matrix. Again, the top row is the high output quantity 64, and the lower row is the low output quantity 48. There are four cells. These little boxes circled with red lines, these are the so-called cells in the payoff matrix. Each cell is a pair of strategy. And this pair of strategy depends on what the column player is playing. Here, American Airlines playing the high output strategy and what the role player is playing. Here in this cell, the United Airlines is playing the high output strategy as well. So each cell is actually a combination of the strategies played by different players in this game. Because each player has two strategies to play and the total number of combination is four, so there are four cells in this matrix to show the outcome when the player playing different strategies in each cell. Let's look at the lower left cell, for example. In this cell, United is playing the low output strategy and American Airlines is playing the high output strategy. So what we are listing here is what is the outcome in terms of profit or payoffs. If American is playing the high output and United is playing the low output strategy, United get 3.8 and American Airlines get 5.1. So these different strategies from the different players pinpoint a cell in the payoff matrix and that cell lists the payoffs to the two players in this game. 
There are different traditions to place the payoffs in the payoff cells. Uh, they can be listed side by side. On the left is for the row player, on the right is for the column player. But uh, typically, we use the so-called American representation, where we place the column player's payoffs on the top right corners in each cell. So these four numbers are the payoffs in the four different outcomes when American Airlines and the United Airlines are playing different strategies, the profits or payoffs to American Airlines. And for the row player, we put their payoff at the lower left corners in each cell. So these numbers in the lower left corner of each payoff cells is for United Airlines. Again, just use another example. If United is playing the high output 64 strategy and American Airlines is playing the low output 48 strategy, United will get a payoff of 5.1 in the lower left corner of this cell. For American Airlines, it will get 3.8. After we have a clear idea what this normal form of representation of the game is about, we can now start to analyze the strategic decision by the different players. Let's look at American Airlines first. Now consider the two strategies, high output level and a low output level, by American Airlines. If United is playing the high output strategy, American Airlines facing getting either 4.1 by playing the high output level or 3.8 by playing the low output level. And obviously, American Airlines should play the high output level, get 4.1. Then, if United Airlines is playing the low output strategy and American Airlines is looking at 5.1 if it played the high output level and 4.6 if it played the low output level. Again, obviously, 5.1 is better than 4.6, so American Airlines will play the high output level again. So whichever strategy United will pick to play, American Airlines is always better off to play the high output strategy. Now, we have a terminology for this kind of strategy for American Airlines, a column player. So. If a player has a strategy that is the best thing to do, no matter which strategy its opponent will take, it is called a dominant strategy. This strategy dominates all other strategies for this player. And if a strategy is not a dominant strategy, then it becomes a dominated strategy. Here, the low output strategy is the better choice in either situation for the different strategies chosen by United Airlines. Then the low output will be the dominated strategy for American Airlines. A rational player in a game will never play dominated strategies. And finally, to demonstrate that the dominated strategy is never played, we use a red line here, a dark red line to cross it out for American Airlines. Then we know, obviously, American Airlines will only play the high output strategy. After analyzing American Airlines strategic reasoning, now we look at this role player, the United Airlines, what United will do. Again, United compare when the American Airlines choosing high output, 4.1 is better than 3.8. If American Airlines is choosing the low output, 5.1 is better than 4.6. The high output strategy is always providing a higher payoff. So it is again the dominant strategy for United because it is a strategy that produces a higher payoff than any other strategy the player can use, no matter what, 
American Airlines, its opponent, can do. So United will always play this dominant strategy, producing at a high output level, and it will never play the dominated strategy in this particular game, the low output level. We use a light red line to cross out the low output level strategy as the dominated strategy. Now, our analysis for the two players is done. And we have crossed out the dominated strategies for each player. Then it turns out there's only one cell left for the two rational players to play. That is, both players play the high output strategy and both players get 4.1 as payoff. When we have dominant strategies for each player and each player only play their dominant strategies, we call that outcome the dominant strategy solution. So the solution concept in game theory for a game is to predict which outcome will result from player's rational reasoning. In this game, we have a unique dominant strategy solution. That means there's just one dominant strategy for each player, and each player will play that one dominant strategy, and that result map to a single cell in this payoff matrix. So we have a clear prediction about what the rational players will do in this game. The reasoning is based on the rationality and the logical reasoning by two players. For example, Let's say United is thinking about which strategy to play, and United know this whole payoff matrix and the two different strategies American Airlines can pick. And United will reason that because I know American Airlines is a rational player, it will never play this low output strategy, it will only play this high output strategy. So when it's playing the high output strategy, it's better for me to play this high output strategy as well. And actually, it doesn't matter whether American will play the high or low output strategy because high output strategy is my dominant strategy to play, so I will just play the high output strategy. So it's American's reasoning. Obviously, United will never play the low output strategy, and we know that when we make our move simultaneously, both United and myself, American Airlines, to play high output strategy will be the single result for this game. However, obviously, 4.1, 4.1 for each player is less than 4.6, and 4.6 for each player. So this outcome, even though it's a rational result, it is not the best possible outcome. And this kind of situation is called a prisoner's dilemma. In a prisoner's dilemma, all players have dominant strategies that lead to a payoff that is inferior to what they could achieve if they cooperated. And we will look at the prisoner's dilemma example next. So let's talk about the most famous game, The Prisoner's Dilemma. The textbook does not provide an actual normal form game for The Prisoner's Dilemma, but I can easily offer you one. People actually say all game theory is about some different form, some variation of The Prisoner's Dilemma. So it's very useful to understand it very well. The story goes like this. We have two suspects, Larry and Duncan, and they were arrested and they were put into separate rooms for interrogation. The assistant district attorney, the so-called DA, tell Larry that if nobody say anything, they only have the evidence to convict them for minor crimes. So each of the two will get one year in prison. 
So the payoff we put in the payoff matrix here is minus one. Now, if Larry confess cooperate with the authority, but Duncan does not, then Duncan get five years in prison and Larry goes free. However, if both of them confessed, they will be convicted with a major crime, but their prison term will be less severe than five years. They will only be put away for two years each. However, if Larry refused to cooperate and Duncan confessed about Larry's crime, Larry will get that five years in prison and Duncan will be set free. In another room, the DA gave Duncan the same offer. Again, let's look at the column player's choice first. That's my habit. Larry compared the payoffs. When Duncan chose to confess, two years is less than five years. So confess for Larry. When Duncan has confessed is a good choice. Compare the payoffs when Duncan does not confess, set free is better than go to prison for a year. So again, compare confess and do not confess. Confess is a better choice. Then confess become Larry's dominant strategy. For Duncan, it's the same story. We look at the difference between the two rows for each column. Then when Larry has confessed, confess is better for Duncan because two years in prison is shorter than five years in prison. When Larry does not confess, it is better for Duncan to confess because go free is better than stay in prison for one year. Again, for the same reason, confess is a dominant strategy for Duncan as well. Then we can cross out do not confess for Larry, do not confess for Duncan. We end up in this cell in the payoff matrix where both players get two years in prison. And obviously, this is not the best outcome possible because if neither of them confess, then they only stay in prison for one year each. But now, because they're playing their dominant strategy, both players are rational and they behave rationally, they got an outcome that is not the best outcome. This result is very important because if you think about what we have learned before, in perfect competitive market, the consumers would like to maximize their consumer surplus or utility. The producers are trying to maximize their profit. Both behave rationally, making rational decision, try to maximize their surplus, and the result is actually optimal. We get the maximum possible total surplus the sum of the producer surplus and the consumer surplus when both parties in a market transaction in the perfect competitive market behave rationally. And uh, the whole society is producing these goods at the lowest possible average cost. Every customer who has a willingness to pay above this lowest average total cost will be able to buy this good. So. In perfect competitive market, we have rational decision makers trying to maximize their own benefits, trying to do their best, and we get optimal outcome, which is the beauty of classic economics. But in prisoner's dilemma, we have people behave rationally and they get a bad outcome. And that is a very controversial result and which can actually help us to understand some phenomenon which does not make sense on the surface. Because we often observe social phenomena that people are trying to do their best and the results they end up getting is not the best possible. Sometimes it's pretty bad. An example is actually shown in the managerial problem at the opening of the chapter. Here, what we have is 
another prisoner's dilemma situation. And we are considering two firms. Their employment opportunity is in a very dangerous environment. The fatality rate on the job can be quite high. And both firms want to consider safety investments. However, if one firm invests in safety, the other firm may be able to free ride because the potential workers do not have the safety information on individual firms. They only have safety information on the industry as a whole. That result in when one firm improved the safety standard in its own firm, it has a benefit effect for the whole industry's safety outcome. The potential workers only can observe that higher safety level in this whole industry, so they will be willing to accept a lower wage offered by the not very safe firm, which has not invested in safety. If these potential workers had known that this particular firm they're working for does not really catch up with the rest of the industry, they will require at least a higher wage or just you know, stay away from working for this dangerous firm. But because they don't have that information, the only thing they can do is to see, well, the whole industry becomes safer, so I would like to accept a lower wage to work for any firm in this industry. In this example here, what do we see, again, from Firm 2's point of view, if Firm 2 invests in safety, it will bear the safety investment cost. So even though Firm 2 helped to lower the risk in the whole industry, it take the cost of producing that safety benefit alone. Firm 1 can actually free ride here, the 250 come from paying lower wage to the workers without safety investment. And you can think, right, the 100 benefit is from paying the uh, lower wage for the workers, but the 150 less than this 250 is because firm 2 has invested in the safety, but the firm 1 hasn't. Same story in this lower left cell, if firm one invests in safety, it bears the full cost of safety investment, so only benefit by $100, but firm two then can benefit by $250. If both firm one and firm two invest in safety, each of them get 225 which is a good outcome for both firms. But if neither firm invests in safety, each of them just get 200 in profit. Now it should be easier to see for firm one, let's start from a role player first. Firm one, right? when firm two do not invest, 200 is better than 100. For firm one again, if firm two invest, 250 is better than 225. For firm two, if firm one do not invest, 200 is better than 100. If firm one invest, for firm 2, 250 is better than 255. So for firm 2, the dominant strategy is do not invest. For firm 1, same thing, no investment in safety. The result is that no firm invests in safety, and the uh, two firms each get 200. However, there is a better outcome available if both firms invest in safety each can get 225. So this is another example of prisoner's dilemma when both players are choosing their dominant strategy, they get into an outcome that is worse than the best possible outcome. You can see that I have named this cell the Nash equilibrium for this game. The concept of Nash equilibrium is based on the idea of best response, which we have seen before in the Kuhner model. And here in static game, the reason we need to have the concept of best response is that for some games, there may not be a single strategy that is a dominant strategy for either player. So if we want to find a solution or say make a prediction of which outcome 
will be played by the players, then we need to have another kind of solution concept that is the next solution concept, Nash equilibrium. Now, from this more complicated game, let's look at the idea of best responses and the Nash equilibrium. Here we allow three different output quantity choices or strategies for each airlines. So both United and American Airlines can choose to either produce 96, 64, or 48. When both firms producing 96, they obtain zero economic profit each. If United produce 96 and American produce 48, United get 4.6 and American Airlines only get 2.3. This lower right for sales is actually our previous prisoner's dilemma result. But basically now we have a new even higher quantity of 96 to be chosen by either airlines. Now let's look at the column player American Airlines choices again. The idea is still conditional on what the role player is doing. So across different columns, we compare the payoffs for American Airlines on each role. If United is producing at 96, Americans consider 96, get 0, 64, get 2, 48, get 2.3. And 2.3 is the so-called best response, given that United is producing at 96. So I circle 2.3, saying that conditional on this strategy of the United Airlines, American Airlines will pick 48 as the best response. Consider the second row. Now, American thinking about what if United Airlines producing at 64? Then compare 3.1, 4.1, 3.8. Obviously, 4.1 is the highest payoff. So when United is producing at 64, American Airlines will produce at 64 as well. Producing 64 units when United is producing 64 is the best response for American Airlines. Finally, America need to consider what if United will pick 48 and American Airlines will look at 4.6, 5.1, 4.6. Again, 5.1 is the best for American Airlines when United is playing the low quantity strategy, 48. So producing 64 is the best response to United Airlines two strategies, if United produce 64 or 48. But producing 64 for American Airlines is no longer a best choice when United Airlines is producing at 96. So for American Airlines, there's no dominant strategy. There's no single strategy is the best thing to do, whatever United Airlines choose to do. Here, when United Airlines choosing to produce at 96, the best thing for American Airlines to do is actually produce at 48. The best response is not 64. But notice producing at 96 for American Airlines is never a best response. So this 96 output quantity strategy is what we call a dominated strategy. It is never a best response. However, producing at 64 and 48 for American Airlines can be the best response under different conditions. The conditions are the different strategies played by United Airlines. So the concept of dominant strategy is basically unconditional. No matter what your rival, your opponent is doing, you just play that one single strategy. It's the dominant strategy. However, the best response is conditional. It's conditional on 
what your opponent or the rival is doing. When your rival is playing a particular strategy, you have potentially a best thing to do to counter the current strategy your rival is playing. Now let's look at United Airlines. For United, it is the role player. So for the role player, what United will be comparing is the payoffs across different rows in each column. When each column represents each strategy for American Airlines. So for this first column on the left, American Airlines is playing 96. Then United compares 0, 2.0, 2.3, 2.3 is the best payoff. So when American Airlines is playing 96, this quantity, United Airlines choose 48. And then in the middle column, United need to compare 3.1, 4.1, 3.8. Obviously, 4.1 is the best payoff. So when American Airlines is playing 64, this quantity strategy, United will play 64 as the best response. Now, in the last column on the right, American Airlines is playing 48. Now, United Airlines, this role player, compared the different payoffs in the three rows. 4.6, 5.1, 4.6, 5.1 is the best possible payoff. So, when American Airlines is playing 48, United choose to play 64 as the best response. Again, the quantity 96 for United Airlines is a dominated strategy. As long as United is rational, it will never play this strategy. And United's best response depends on the choice of strategy by American Airlines. If American Airlines choose 96, United's best response is 48. American Airlines choose 64, United's best response is 64. American Airlines choose 48, United's best response is 64 again. As before, the 64 quantity strategy for United Airlines is the best response to only two strategies of American Airlines, so it is not a dominant strategy. If we put the best responses for American Airlines and the United Airlines in the same payoff matrix, we see that there's one cell, this cell in the middle, has two best responses from both players. And that is the Nash equilibrium, the outcome we will predict for this game in this payoff matrix. The Nash equilibrium is based on the concept of best response. And when all the players in the game are playing their best responses together at the same time, no player would like to deviate from what they are doing. So, under Nash equilibrium, what we say is that given the strategies played by all the other players in the game, no single player would want to change their choice. No single player will regret what they are doing right now, because this player has chosen the best possible response already, and that is in the Nash equilibrium. In that sense, nobody wants to change what they are doing, which is exactly the equilibrium concept we have talked about before. Even when we analyzing the market transactions between the buyers and the sellers or buyers and the producers. This next Otherizing game basically tells us that whether a Nash equilibrium can be the best possible outcome really just depends on the properties of the game or say the setup of the payoff matrix. And if I flip between the two slides, you will see here in these slides, the Nash equilibrium is different from the best outcome. I will explain that later, but on this next slide, the Nash equilibrium and the best outcome coincide. They are in the same cell. The reason is this. If we think about the two rivals, they launch advertising campaigns. 
and the campaign itself does not bring in new customer. So the pie they're dividing is still the same size. Then all they have done is just create some buzz among the consumers and the, these, the same amount of consumers still just behave the same. And all they have done is throw dollar into the television or into the newspaper. So when both of them advertise, the payoff is just one. Compared to if neither of them advertise, they can keep the $1 advertising expense in the pocket. However, if one advertise, the other do not, the one that launched an advertising campaign will gain. It will steal from the other firm who is not advertising. This firm which has launched an advertised campaign will not capture the total profit for because it has to pay one to launch this campaign. Same story for firm two as the role player. If firm two launched this advertising campaign, it will gain three and steal all the customers from firm one, but it has to pay one for the advertising cost. However, if both firms advertise, they still have the same customer base as before, each just pay one for the advertising cost, bring down their profit from two to one. And if we solve this game quickly, for the role player, three is higher than two, one is higher than zero. This is the dominant strategy to advertise for the role player. Same story for firm one, the column player, three is higher than two, one is higher than zero. Advertising is the dominant strategy, so this will be the Nash equilibrium. Obviously, advertise is the best response to the other firm's advertising strategy. But this Nash equilibrium doesn't yield the best outcome. The story is different in the next payoff matrix here, because here we assume that when even just the one firm launch a advertising campaign, it can bring new customer into the market. So both firm actually benefit. Here, if firm one launch a campaign, firm one gain let's say total five unit of increased profit before deduct one for the advertising cost. So the firm one's profit is four. And firm two just benefit from general awareness of this product for the public. So new customer compare firm one's product and firm two's product, maybe choose firm two's product, even though they only have heard about the message from firm one. So firm two also gain just simply one unit of profit from two to three. If both firm launch their own advertising campaign, the message will reach into even broader audience and bring in more new customer, make both firms benefit. And the result is that both firm increase by four minus one from two increase to five, four minus one is three. Right? You bring in more customer, get you higher gross profit before we deduct a one unit cost of the advertising. Now, if we look at this payoff matrix, for firm one, four is higher than two, five is higher than three. Advertising is the dominant strategy. It's the best response to firm two's both strategies. For firm two, advertising is the best response to firm one's both strategies. So this lower right cell is the Nash equilibrium. It is also the best outcome. Again, the lesson here is that whether a Nash equilibrium is the best outcome really depends on the payoff matrix.